Hello and welcome to the second episode of Ride Out with Ampla, where we talk about all the things we care about. Today's episode will focus on how to reduce the supremacy of motor vehicles in our lives in order to create a friendly and equal space for everyone in our cities. We have two sets of guests. We have Chris and Melissa Brentlet calling in from the Netherlands and they recently published a book about how to curb traffic. And the second set of guests are an NGO from Estonia called Elav Danav, but trying to achieve pretty much a similar setup, hopefully in the future in Tallinn, than we already have in a lot of cities in the Netherlands. So tune in. So our first guests today are Melissa and Chris Brundlet, calling in from Delft, the Netherlands. And um, Chris and Melissa recently, just last week, published a book called Curbing Traffic, the Human Case for Fewer Cars in Our Lives. Um, what inspired you to write the book and uh, what it's about? Well, I think the inspiration for us sort of came from our first year having moved from Vancouver in Canada on the West Coast to Delft, uh, which is a much smaller town, um, very quiet, very quaint, uh, and really recounting a lot of the experiences that we had over the course of the first year and the qualitative benefits that really came uh, through those experiences. I think we both moved here uh, knowing what we were getting into a little bit, having traveled here in 2016 for five weeks, uh, which was the inspiration for our first book, Building the Cycling City, the Dutch Blueprint for Urban Vitality. Uh, so we knew that we were moving to a very cycle-friendly place, um, a much uh, lower car-dominated space, but over time, we started to realize individually how that environment was really starting to impact our stress levels in a positive way, reducing them. We felt much more connected to our community and even being outsiders uh, who didn't speak a language, really connecting with people on a very social level. Yeah, we kind of joked that we did it backwards and that our first book provided the how. Uh, how do you achieve the levels of success that the Netherlands currently uh, enjoys and the second book is is totally focused on the why so um, maybe it makes sense to re read them in reverse order but not the typical whys that we're used to talking about I think when we talk about reducing car use we're often talking about climate change or physical health or uh, air pollution um, for us reducing car dominance and car dependency uh, and based on our experiences here in Delft, is, is so much more com complicated and, and, and nuanced and, and bigger than that. About the human experience of living in a city, being connected to your community, uh, being able to take those moments to breathe and, and relax and unstress. Uh, and, and as we saw, as living as residents of the Netherlands and not just visitors, as, as we did with the first book, we saw how that impacted our children getting to school and to friends' houses. We saw our neighbors, some of whom were elderly and disabled, um, how they were able to participate in society. So um, this is, yeah, as we often say, it's much bigger than just a, a conversation about transportation. It's about transforming the city into something that is much more inclusive and equitable and, and uh, um, enjoyable for, for everyone that lives there. We have uh, all these photos running in the background, uh, which you sent us uh, prior to this interview. And uh, I'm pretty sure that a lot of people, including myself, are planning to uh, move to Delft now after, <laughs> after reading the book and, and watching this. Um, there was a really interesting uh, point in your book, which said that you live in a city that treats cars as guests rather than guests of honor. And um, so what do you think a city needs to do in order to achieve that? Or what is the secret of Delft? Or how is the city set up uh, in order to have cars as guests? Well, I, I think first we'd emphasize that it's not just Delft. It's, it's literally hundreds of cities across the Netherlands yeah. that have these conditions and this quality of life from the capitals uh, and the, the metropolitan areas like Rotterdam, Amsterdam, and, and The Hague, but also the smaller cities, yeah, like Delft and Leiden and, and, and Zwolle and, and Groningen. Um, they've done it everywhere, and it's really remarkable, but it's it's a very simple set of policy decisions that started in the 1970s that um, pushed traffic away from the sensitive residential areas and the uh, economic heart of the city, uh, the city centre, uh, created segregated uh, space for walking, cycling, rolling um, along those streets where the, the volumes and the speeds of cars made it necessary to segregate from, uh, from the motor vehicle traffic. 
making the city center itself mostly car free in, in so far as only uh, freight service and uh, vehicles and, and residents can enter the, the city center on cars um, and creating these amazing livable streets that are uh, slowed to a speed of 15 to 20 kilometers an hour include uh, seating and trees and, and places where people want to stay. You have a very detailed uh, description also in the book about how in 1970s this kind of transformed in the Netherlands. Um, but what was the turning point? Uh, where did this change come from? Because it definitely came from the people, right? Because people started seeing the change they didn't like anymore. Or uh, what is the turning point? Yeah, I think there's there's two key events that happened in the 70s that sort of sparked the um, transition away from more autocentricity to something that's more human scale. Uh, the first was as cars, like everywhere else in the world, started becoming much more dominant in the streets, the congestion and traffic volumes really increased. Traffic safety declined drastically to the point where the the numbers of deaths per year were in the thousands, including a high number of children. And mm. so a movement called Stop to Kinder Mord, which translates to Stop Child Murder, emerged, uh, which was a um, confluence of parents, of teachers, even children uh, coming together and saying, this is not acceptable. It is not okay to allow for the freedom of movement and freedom of movement for cars in place of the safety of our most vulnerable. And so that was very much a people driven. At the same time in 1973, the Netherlands was one of the countries to be impacted by the OPEC oil crisis. And so huge fuel shortages caused um, basically a lack of ability to drive affordably. And the Dutch government imp imposed uh, car free Sundays as a response to this to try to save the fuel they had for the important trips or logistics that needed to happen. And as a result, people started to see their city uh, every Sunday without it being choked with cars. Reminded them of these social spaces on their streets um, where they could see their neighbors and they could talk to people and they could get around safely on foot, bike or, or what have you. So these two events sort of sparked uh, what followed and really spurred that forward at the same time with politicians that were willing to um, really push back against the status quo that had been building and say, we need cities that work better for every person, not just those behind the wheel of a car. I feel like also in your book, you touch a very important point, which is uh, about social well-being and about being connected. Uh, because I myself also see this very sad um, pattern happening in a lot of really big cities where people live in their cars and streets are more like car tunnels rather than these... Uh, uh, spaces for everyone and the city should be a safe space for everyone from 8 to 80 year old and should be um, a distinct space where you can move around and you don't have to be scared or it shouldn't be uncomfortable when you're disabled for example and the very important point in your book is also talking about children and uh, the mental well-being of children and you have this interesting term which is um, the indoor and backseat children can you elaborate on that a little bit yeah, I think we were inspired to write that chapter seeing our own uh, children who, when we moved here, were 9 and 11, really spread their wings and become uh, the independent young adults that we wanted them to be. And it was largely because of the built environment here mm -hmm. that allowed them to do so. Um, but we got into the research of, 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 you know, what impact that has on children and inversely what it means for kids that grow up either in their bedrooms or in the back seat of their parents' car. Um, and, and we came across Dr. Leah Karsten from the University of Amsterdam, and she was luck, uh, really uh, gracious enough to um, uh, pr provide her time in, in conducting an interview and, and, and her research papers. And she's coined this term, yeah, the, the backseat generation, um, which, which is a really sad indictment of, of the, the cities and the society we've shaped um, who are most vulnerable uh, and uh, children are now in, in a lot of cities around the world, not exposed to their neighbors, their neighborhoods. They're not outside uh, moving around independently or playing independently outside of the supervision of their parents. They're not able to assess and take risks. They're not, you know, they're not able to learn from their mistakes. They're, and they're growing up in this very protected sphere uh, under their parents' eye. Uh, and it's having tremendously negative uh, impacts as they grow into young adults and start applying to university and, and trying to get into 
college and 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 uh, and uh, get their first jobs. And um, this is becoming a, a tremendous problem for us because we build streets for cars. And, and it's not just the children; it's also the elderly. Because you also sp speak about how elderly people are very isolated because you don't have the communities anymore where neighbors speak to each other because you don't have the space anymore because cars kind of claim the space from the people. But um, mm -hmm. do you see the shift happening now that people are more aware and, um, and what do cities need to do or what do people need to do in order to shift towards the Dutch model? Uh, I think there's definitely a shift happening. It's something that we've been observing now throughout the, the course of the last 10 years while we've been advocating for better cycling and better public space and walking. Um, but it's it's slow. And I think that's one thing we always remind people is that the progress here even was slow. I mean, this started in the late 60s, early 70s, and we have stories of up until 1996 or early 2000s, some of these public spaces were still dominated by cars. And that, so it's, it's taken time. But I think what's really promising is we're seeing uh, a lot of cities start to prioritize creating uh, walking and cycling plans, uh, looking at their public realms, uh, not just you know in Europe, but also throughout North America. We see some great uh, strategies coming, uh, countless cities that is on the human scale and the human experience. And so there is that shift. And I think uh, one of the things Chris and I will both agree on is that COVID really pushed that to the forefront for a lot of people. Definitely. Um, as we started, yeah, as we're as we're home and, and we, you know, a lot of us were forced to work from home, those of us not working essential jobs, uh, the outdoor space became our ability to uh, recharge, to have those social connections, um, to find those moments of like just a therapeutic escape from the day to day. Uh, and city makers and, and urban planners have seen that and some are really capitalizing on that. I think one of the most notable uh, that we found is actually in the city of Sydney, they had a plan or still have a plan to expand their cycle network in Australia. Um, and that plan was supposed to be executed between now and 2056. And it's been expedited to happen much, much sooner to allow people those opportunities for physical, um, physical experience of their city, but also more active means and more social means. I mean, we, we mentioned the OPEC oil crisis in the book in the chapter about resilience, uh, drawing parallels to the current coronavirus uh, crisis in the hopes that just like the, the oil crisis was a turning point for the Netherlands, hopefully uh, COVID-19 can be a turning point for other cities around the world. The trick is now, yes, learning from the cities and countries that have done it before. The Netherlands had a, a 20 year period in the 70s and 80s where they were just kind of experimenting and innovating and a lot of mistakes were made. They were figuring out what worked and what didn't work and, and what, what best practices uh, weren't established until probably the, the, the 1990s. We're in a, a fortunate situation now where we can skip that whole 20 year trial and error because the Netherlands has figured out what works and what doesn't work in terms of cycle network design, instead of in terms of intersection design, in terms of crossword design for pedestrians. Um, these are all, uh, they're sitting in, in manuals for us to not necessarily copy paste, but draw inspiration from and adapt to our own cities and, a, and our own context. I mean, there was definitely a huge shift uh, due to COVID, which you could see in a lot of um, countries, also in Europe. Uh, when you speak about uh, Germany, like Berlin, for example, or Italy, or even France, um, I really, really hope that the shift is here to stay and it wasn't just a phase uh, that was kind of built to, to meet the needs of a current status. Um, but from my own side, as I did read the book, I, I can say that I, I really hope that your book will kind of become a manual for a lot of politicians and, and kind of shifts the mindset of them as well. And we're going to see the shift in general in, in a lot of cities in the future because I do believe this is the future. And um, do you have any, any final words for people, um, like any, any pointers from your book or anything you would like to emphasize? I think, you know, something that we both really strive for in the book uh, that we'd, we'd really want to emphasize is that, um, as Chris pointed out at the beginning, this book is the why, and it's, but it's the why that people don't expect. It's mm -hmm. uh, the why in terms of who we are as, as people, as, a, as human beings, and how our cities are currently hurting us because of uh, car dominance, from increased stress, from social isolation, from uh, decreased activity. 
any any number of, of health impacts that our cities are having, we really hope that the book helps to communicate what those are and why we need to shift away from them. Not just to make streets safe better for biking and walking, but to make them better for us, healthier for us as people. And that starts with bringing everyone to the table. And I think a lot of the problems we've discussed today from the children to the elderly to people with disabilities, they're often left out of the urban and transport planning uh, conversation. So simply by bringing them to the table, asking them what they'd like to see in their city, instead of it just being the most affluent uh, sitting there that have the time and the energy to uh, tell the politicians and, and the planners what they want, we should be doing a better job in terms of engagement and, and, and starting a conversation in our cities about what other people need and, and want. Because right now, um, as we point out in the book, uh, nearly half of, of most cities do not have a driver's license or the means to drive a car, and, and yet they're completely excluded from not just the streets, but from society. And, and, and um, this, this, as we hope, uh, is a, a start of a conversation to bring those people into the conversation uh, and, and seeing better future for our city that includes absolutely everybody. Well, thank you so much. It's been an honor to, to have you in the show. And uh, I'm really looking forward to any future books you're going to publish. And for this one, as I said, I really hope that everything you describe in the book will, will be the future of the cities. And thank you so much. Thanks so much for having us. It's a pleasure. Cities are changing all the time, uh, but sometimes the change that needs to happen must happen faster. And I think right now is the time because we are still using the old streets uh, with confusing crossings as this one, uh, but uh, people want new ways of, of moving. They want to use bicycles, scooters, everything else, but the streets do not support that. So how do we change that? Because I think that otherwise we are putting people's life in danger. And this is a good example right here, because the crossing is very confusing for drivers, uh, bicycle riders and everybody else, and we wanted to change that. So we went to the city government and said that this is not good, we need to change that. What happened then? It happened that the uh, city government said, yeah, we have seen it also, but we don't have uh, people who can actually draw it up. We are so over... Uh, overbooked. Over, overbooked, yeah. But we said, yeah, but we can do it, no And problem. this guy, uh, he can draw it up, he's, the, he's professional in this, and surprisingly quickly we said that we can make it for you. Yeah, so we drew up the basic plan for the area and showed it to city government. They said, ah, it's undoable, it's, uh, you can't, uh, I don't know, you can't get the trash out of the streets anymore and etc. We went back, made some little changes and showed that everything works as it's supposed to be showed it again to the city government and then they were already like, okay, maybe it can happen. That's a couple of uh, sessions more and now we are in the situation where the pre-marking of the new uh, traffic uh, solution is already done. Uh, in next days, uh, they're probably gonna do it with uh, thermoplastic so that it will be permanent and we will have a more uh, exact, more compact, more uh, precise uh, solution for these, uh, this crossing and these adjacent streets here that will, uh, yeah, it will be more uh, convenient and more clear for uh, drivers. Uh, as the car speeds are going to get a little bit slower, the, it's more safe for uh, cyclists between the traffic. All the crossings for uh, pedestrians will be more uh, shorter and uh, more uh, understandable, but also we will uh, have cup quite a lot of new uh, public space, for example, around this uh, traffic island there, the uh, further part will be just a uh, part of this uh, quarter square where the cafe, cafe can uh, expand. And this is uh, actually a great example. Cities move slowly, but this is a quick change. Uh, only in a couple of months uh, was the first talks and now there is a plan. And maybe or even next week, those markings become a real thing. Here will be green stuff, people can sit here and it's not a part of the street anymore, but cars can still move. So it's all about design. 
So a second set of guests are from an Estonian-based NGO called Elav Tana, which in translation means livable street. And I have Mata Lippos and Tony Savi from this NGO here. Um, so we're going to talk about why did this Elav Tana come into life? Uh, what are the kind of critical points in Tallinn, continuing the topic we had with the Dutch-based uh, Chris and, um, and Melissa before. And uh, so tell us, what is Elav Danav and uh, what, is, uh, what is the, uh, like the birth story of this organization? Uh, so Elav Danav is a really new NGO. I think we like, started uh, almost a month ago. And as the name suggests, uh, we started it to make uh, the streets in Tallinn uh, more livable. Because uh, one really big problem, I think we all seven that we uh, started this NGO or this uh, civic movement uh, felt, is that it's good to maybe to drive in Tallinn streets. But if you want to cycle or you want to walk, you actually don't feel that comfortable. So we just say that Elav Danav is an organization where a group of like-minded people came together because everyone just kind of had enough. Uh, because looking at some other, other uh, cities in Europe, um, well, the Netherlands obviously is, uh, is like an extreme example how well things are, but also looking at closer cities like uh, Riga or Helsinki, for example, and wanting this change or this shift also to happen in Tallinn. Well, exactly. It's uh, perfectly put in my, <laughs> in my opinion. <laughs> so when you talk about Riga or Helsinki, for example, what are the shifts that have happened there in the past years and what do you think uh, you can also achieve in Tallinn? I don't know exactly the political shifts in Helsinki. I think Helsinki has developed more like linearly. I remember Helsinki like 10, maybe even 15 years ago. And remember the shifts when it started to like show more and more bicycles on the streets. I used to go every year to Flow Festival and then you saw how the uh, bicycle parking place next to the festival just grew and grew. And then one year it just exploded. With Riga, I think the, they have struggled quite long. And for them, the change came with uh, change in political uh, governance. Mm -hmm. The party who has been there in charge for, uh, yeah, I don't know, over a decade, they lost their like power, and now the new powers, they do things differently. Yeah, but I think that yeah, there is uh, there has been a change in political level maybe, and I think uh, Dennis put it uh, really great that the, uh, the development has been more linear maybe in Helsinki. But I think what has uh, happened in all over Europe and also in Tallinn is that the people just have started to cycle more. Uh, we, we you can really see it in Tallinn how uh, um, walking lanes are full of people cycling, walking, uh, s uh, using scooters. So it's really, well, I started to, um, like, uh, another movement uh, in Tallinn to, to make streets more livable in 20, 20 years ago. And we did a lot, but we just weren't, I think uh, the Italian people just weren't maybe that ready for this kind of movement. But now I really feel that uh, the, we kind of have the momentum or, or people are really willing uh, and they, they really need this change. And that's why I think this is a starting point for us also in Tallinn is it's much better. I think in general, when you speak about um, Tallinn or the mentality here, uh, the streets are built for the cars, as you said before. And um, there's, uh, there's a lot of uh, research done on the fact that when people spend majority of their commuting time in a car, it also shifts their brain chemistry in a way that they feel very isolated and they kind of lose the self of, uh, self sense of empathy. Mm -hmm. And um, in Tallinn, the shift kind of has to also happen for the benefit of our children, right? Because children become very disconnected from the environment if they spend majority of the time in a backseat of a car. So, what do you think Tallinn's like critical points are at the moment that could be changed in, let's say, the next five years? I think the main uh, shift that has to happen is that we, uh, first of all, don't care so much about the capacity of uh, traffic anymore. Uh, second is that we bring the speeds down on the streets. And third is like just follow the actually the strategic uh, goals that we have set. Like the city has really nice strategic goals, but we don't just follow them. Um, the bicycle strategy, you have the, uh, the strategy of 2035, uh, uh, and also all, some other development documents like from 2000. They all like predict nice like Central Europe future for the city. Let's say, but yeah. 
if you act differently, then it will like it will end up in different world. Like if you just care about uh, capacity, you will generate uh, just more and more traffic, mm -hmm. or like you make the yeah, the street pipe wider for cars, and it will fill up because you have to like that's the convenient way to travel in the end. When, it, sorry, when we talk about the bicycle strategy, Dennis, you were one of the people who uh, uh, was kind of forming it or building it. Um, and that was already a few years ago. So what is the reason it was never executed or what was kind of the, like, the obstacle there? Uh, like Vladimir Svet, uh, former uh, head of Central uh, Tallinn, now head of Lasnama, uh, he said that um, the biggest mistake with bicycle strategy was the name of strategy on top of the cover. Because uh, in Tallinn, the, like the governance culture has been that strategies are on the shelf. Mm -hmm. You don't use them. You make them, you can refer to them when it's uh, needed, but you don't act like according to it. I think, but yeah, in the end, something went also quite right with the spicy strategy. I think the fact that it was uh, like um, put together differently than usual development documents and the fact that it was actually like designed and uh, like um, made as a book, not just a document, word document somewhere. It somehow started to live its life. Yeah, it's been four years so that there hasn't been too much development mm -hmm. according. But we see in these uh, local elections that the bicycle strategy is somehow one of the like main promises for all of the parties now. So okay. yeah, I hope that we have yeah four years missed four years of the development, but I hope that now it's the time to like set the gear in. Because we don't fit on the streets anymore. That's why, right? Yeah. Mm. And uh, Madla, uh, tell us what is the current status of Elavdana? Uh, what have you already done, or what are the plans for the next months? Uh, yeah, well, at the moment we are really uh, starting, so we are just about to create this plan. But mainly we have uh, three main goals. Uh, and the first is to really see that Tallinn is uh, uh, fulfilling their strategic goals. So to see what are the strategies that are at the moment uh, on the shelf and to connect connect them or to compare them with uh, like real life uh, actions that for example how are streets repaired if they are repaired if they are really done according to the principles that are written down in the strategies and I think that is one of the most important goals because really we have really really nice strategies but nothing is happening according to them mm. the second goal is to uh, um, energize or engage people in really making the streets livable because it's not only the city who can change streets. Actually, I believe that people have much more uh, potential in, uh, in creating the streets. They just have to be let free or they have to be able to do what they want to do there. But it's, it's the same as ha happened in the Netherlands. Uh, the previous guest said in 1970, mm -hmm. it was the people who actually made the change. Mm -hmm. And otherwise also the Netherlands would be in the same state as, uh, for example, Estonia mm -hmm. is. So it is all about the people. It is, yeah. Well, the change, in my opinion, can come from both sides. Mm -hmm. It can come from the city co uh, council or it can come from the people. But we now feel that people really are willing to do something and we just want to, you know, give them this uh, channel push. <laughs> or this push <laughs> yeah, so they can just like move forward. And uh, the third um, uh, direction we are really willing to work is to, maybe it sounds a bit weird, but we want to give people the vocabulary mm -hmm. or the knowledge what actually a good street is because we are in Tallinn we are so used to have the streets we have. It's like our everyday surroundings. And, and although we, we we used to travel quite a lot and see other kinds of cities, it's still sometimes a bit difficult to translate mm -hmm. or to transport it to your city. So we are really willing to, with campaigns and with uh, happenings, to show people how you can change your home street mm -hmm. uh, actually really easily. So these are uh, the main. Uh, the main three uh, goals we want to achieve, and as we have local elections in September, so uh, I think the timing for us, it's really, really good. But it's not just about the, the urban landscape, because we're also talking about our health, uh, both physical and mental health. We're talking about mm -hmm. our children. Um, we previously had this topic about the indoor and backseat children, because 
the kids, when they spend the majority of their time in the backseat of their parents' mm -hmm. car, they, they miss out on the whole social, um, social experience of commuting or on their own or meeting other kids and even taking risks and, you know, uh, being part of some smaller accidents which actually grow their character and then, like, prep them for future. So I feel like in Tallinn that's really missing because if the streets are claimed by their cars, then kids don't have room or space there. Mm -hmm. So this is kind of also a very important shift. And the other thing is the, the health factor. Firstly, it's mental health. Uh, and the second is physical health because the fact that Estonian kids are also becoming obese is not a secret anymore. It's actually been statistics that were also like, published a few months ago. Yeah, if you would ask me, that's what is the most important shift I would like to see in Tallinn's uh, cityscape, I think it's connectivity. Mm. Because if uh, at the moment uh, different uh, places are connected to cars, but yeah, actually, uh, but really not for children. For example, my child who goes to the first grade, he goes, he cycles to school every day, like three kilometers, but it's quite complicated to get there. And other parents are always looking at me that, are you crazy? Mm. Because he has to cross several big uh, roads and actually, uh, I know that it's a kind of, uh, <laughs> yeah, it's not so secure as it could be. But, uh, and I think for many people, for many parents, that's actually the obstacles, obstacle that uh, different places we need and want to visit, mm. they are not connected. And we have to start to look to the connectivity mm -hmm. of the city, also in viewpoint of uh, cyclers and, uh, and people walking, mm. uh, walking the street. And again, it, it's not like, like cars or bicycles need to be competing with each other. We all have room, but we all need to have safe space for each other. And also the city shouldn't be built in a way that is only comfortable for motorists. It should be comfortable for, for children, for disabled, for elderly people. And currently in Tallinn, there's a pretty long way to go there, right? It depends on the areas, I would say. Like, but also I would say that the comfort of motorists is also like so dodgy sorry. feeling <laughs> about it in, uh, in Tallinn. Like all the, like, so, I just, uh, a couple of weeks ago, I was like arguing with somebody about the uh, comfort of motorists, and I was thinking, okay, when I'm driving a car, where I don't, where I'm actually uncomfortable in Tallinn. Mm. I actually ended up figuring out that these are the same spaces where I'm uncomfortable with the bicycle, mm. and where it's also really uncomfortable with uh, with uh, if, if you're walking. So there are actually these uh, complex, like uncertain areas where. Nobody actually knows how to move there. You can go too fast with the car, for example, and at the same time, there is some pedestrian crossing. Of course, pedestrians come a little bit as a surprise in mm. that moment. Um, when you talk about Elav Danav in general, um, what are your um, suggestions to people who've also considered, and maybe in other cities or other countries, who considered uh, forming something similar, but they don't know where to start? How do you start? Uh, my suggestion always is to start talking to people, just to know, just to get to see if there are people like-minded with you, if they have similar ambitions. Well, basically, it's the same how it started with us. It wasn't with us. It just was that uh, some of those guys who are now formed uh, the group, they just wrote an article. So it also can be an article. And then you just uh, see people, or you meet people who think similarly, and. Uh, and yeah, then, uh, then, then there's a potential that something will uh, come out of this. Okay. Um, when you have any, um, do you have any like comments uh, to Tallinn, Tallinn city or like, do you, would you like to say anything? Because I know that you are, you're working with them or you're trying to work with them, not against them. Mm -hmm. And that's a really important fact about this organization, right? Yeah, of course you have to work with city government. Although it sometimes means that you have to go also head to head with them. But in the end, yeah, if you want to get some changes, then you have to like, be somehow a like, uh, constructive partner for the city government in the end. You can be critical, mm -hmm. but you have to be uh, constructive. Uh, then you can achieve some changes. Like, uh, during the time of Tallinn bicycle uh, strategy, for example, like creating it, we were extremely critical about city government at the mm -hmm. same time. But we got also like invited back to some meetings Although, like, they knew actually exactly what we were going to say, but it, the things we were, were saying, they weren't just like, oh, you are bad, but you were like going, you were constructive, like you were exact, uh, argumented, and uh, that, that then you can also be critical, yeah. 
Okay. Well, thank you so much for joining us uh, in our show, and I wish you all the best in your future uh, in Duo Wars. <laughs> and I hope to see you again in some future episodes. Thank you. Uh, thanks. Thanks. Thank you for watching. We really hope you enjoyed our second episode. Uh, we're very curious to hear how things are running in your city. So if you want to contribute, then drop your ideas or feedback in the comment section. And we'll see you again in our next episode.